Okay, so um, I want to thank you all for being here this evening. I want to make a few disclaimers. That I know that if I speak from the head and from the heart that it's more engaging. But I have written it down because um, a few years back I did this um, exhibition called Agnosia, uh, not knowing. And then for the newspaper I claimed that the Netherlands had not sent a black artist to the biennial before. So of course all of the Netherlands fell over me like we did uh, send a black artist to the biennial before we sent um, Stanley Brown, you know, we sent a few other people. And what I found then at that moment is that I have to be exact in saying what I mean. And what I tried was trying to say that we had not sent a black artist with black concerns to the biennial before. So, having said that, I wrote it down what I have to say, so I'm as exact as possible. Also specifically because it's being recorded and it's online at, as we speak, which I kind of hate because that means, you know, it has all sorts of implications. Anyhow. The talk is, today is called Notes on the Absence of Blackness, the Measurement of Presence. The critic Rutger Ponce noted in the Volkskrant 2018, it was a matter of time. The Dutch sub submission as a white bastion is over. Three artists of Surinamese origin represent the Netherlands at the Venice Biennial. Going to 2018, we had artists of color representing the Netherlands. Stanley Brown is one of them. However, they have done so under the, under the then prevailing modernity. So what we've not had is an artist of color representing the Netherlands and their color, so to speak, being self-evident. Now, the question that I would like to see answered is, could we have an artist be presented at the Venice Biennial in all their fabulous blackness and that presented as Dutch? We're getting there. These were my words in 2018 during the previous uh, submission to the Biennial which was Wendelin van Oldeborg, uh, if we can remember. So in the original title, I'll go through some, some things just so you understand what it's all about. The original title of this submission to the Venice Biennial was the measurement of presence, body, spirit, history, which aimed to present new perspectives on the notion of national identity. Curator Benno Temple brought together these three artists because each of them from the vantage point of their practices make us see the world differently. All three artists are of Surinamese Dutch descent, but the important similarity is, according to Temple, the inspiration they find in modernism and the avant-garde of the previous century, which, in their work, they combine with elements from other traditions and positions. In the title, the work body is a reference to the work of Stanley Brown and his system of measurements based on his body. The word spirit references Remy Jungemann, who investigates rituals from the Vinti religion and is fed through uh, what the spirits tell him, or so the texts say. So Iris Kent's, Mill re Iris Kent's Mill's research into black women's underappreciated contribution refers to the word history. Given the Dutch sensibilities with regards to the national self-image, how do you begin to write about the 2019 pavilion at the Venice Biennial? Now, this is not in the text, but I do want to tell you that um, I was asked to write a piece for the Biennial. I'm actually quoting from it now. And I was extremely conflicted because of, um, as I said earlier, uh, the elephant in the room the huge elephant in the room, which Nancy Awa actually only touched upon, but also my loyalties towards my fellow artists, loyalties towards the funding body, which is Mandrian Fonds, loyalties towards the Netherlands, which is my country, loyalties towards the investment in what I call cultural citizenship, in which I am part of. So for me, writing this piece, how does it, how, for me the question was, how can it contribute to a larger 
understanding of what our cultural citizenship might be, right? Without dropping the R word. So there you go. So critic Richard Ponzo makes a point of remarking that the previous submission was also multicultural. In it, Wendelin van Oldeborg, who is white, focused on the colonial past, which according to her was consciously forgotten. In the current political cl climate, where there is much debate about local identities, sending in Dutch Afro artists produces the kind of conversation which underscores van Oldeborg's point about the forgottenness. The provocation stems from an antiquated understanding of Dutchness as a univocal, ethnical identity. This interpreta interpretation resists an understanding of the 21st century as one in which migration is the cultural condition from which to depart. The Dutch artists that are central to this catalog inhabit this subjective approach. The Wakaman book, you know it? Good. Yesterday, I met Wakaman. I'm going to quote, take your time, because this was written 10 years ago. Little Red Riding Hood takes me by the hand and pulls me into the Dutch market. I struggle a bit. She doesn't stop. She just looks back playfully while gently squeezing my hand and enticing me with her mysterious smile. When we get to the heart of the market, she lets go of my hand, spreads her arms and frivolously spins around. This is all yours. This is the public domain, she says. It looks more like a sweatshop, if you ask me. There are so many stalls to the right, the font for visual flavors. To the left, the Fon Abba Museum. Next door, whiter than white. Across the way, artifact department of your norms. The municipal omission, and so on, and so on. Blissfully, we stroll around the market. Hours become days, become months, become years. As the years pass, Little Red Riding Hood finds it harder going. So one day I ask her, what about the big bad wolf? Shouldn't we be careful as we go through this forest of opportunities? She dismisses my question with a way of saying, that wolf is about as dangerous as Santa's little helpers. She walks an oblivious on oblivious, not waiting for me. From her tone, I gather that she has no interest in this conversation or any other conversation. As I catch up with her, she offers me her arm. I pretend I haven't noticed. Little Red Riding Hood, when will this fairy tale end, I ask her. This time she doesn't answer at all and beckons me over to the stall of Okwi and the razor blades. With a side of protest, I go with her little red riding hood, I try again, while we rummage through Okwi's merchandise. Little red riding hood, when or rather how does this fairy tale end? Will I turn into a prince or stay forever a frog? Because although I believe in fairy tales, I also know that a fairy tale without an ending is my worst nightmare. She looks at me with weary lethargy. Don't fret so much, boy. She gives me a peck on the cheek. Jeder hat sich schon die Frage gestellt, wo ist mein Zuhause oder was ist das Zuhause, Heimat? Now, with an ingra ingratiating glance, she looks me straight in the eye, knowing I hate it when she starts with that German bullshit. I'm not fretting, I mutter under my breath, only I hesitate, purse my lips, drop my shoulders inside just long enough to drain my lungs of the last drop of air. When I catch her eye, I pull the trigger. And so I challenge the impossibility of taking roots in the fragments, taking roots in the lines of flight, taking root in the root, and proclaim myself Wakamang. Yesterday, I met Wakamang. Yesterday, you met the future. It was cultural policy of the 1990s that turned working visual artists that inhabited this then unknown 21st century subjectivity into a lochtenous artist that, according to policymakers, needed an extra push. With suspicion casted on their artistic production, the artists were drawn into the historical quality argument, the historical quality argument, which entails the false binary between race or ethnicity or gender and the quality of the work. And in this case, I specifically want to speak about the quality argument 
as the false binary between race and the quality of the work. In an effort to move away from the implicitly racialized space that was reserved for them, those measures, um, through these measures, and imagine a different horizon from the, for the future, the three artists, Remy Jungemann, Gillian Gransan, and Michael Tseja, established Wakaman at the beginning of this century. It was a collective of artists that aimed at creating a solid critical framework in which their work could be understood. The artists were invested in producing an environment that considered the full dimensions of their artistic subjectivity. Collectively and individually, they advanced the discussion about the relation between their subjectivity and their so-called background. They demanded recognition for their Dutch cultural citizenship through their art practice. The internal dialogue, which, played, which partly played out in the public uh, sphere, raised a set of questions for these artists, such as, why polarize? Are we perhaps radicalizing? Is it about power? Is it about money and power? And these questions point toward the Dutch non-racist self-image. Um, sorry, these question point yeah, I thought my sentence didn't flow, so I'll be back. <laughs> These questions point toward the Dutch non-racist self-image where pointing out racial issues in itself is considered polarizing, it's considered instigated racism, and I feel that the questions that these artists were asking at that time were, you know, um, showing the lack of regard that they must have experienced for the work they were producing. So the text accompanying the invitation of their first uh, Wakama exhibition in 2005 and 10 read, Wakamang does not produce scattershot that hardly needs effort. His art is not a game, no quickie, no blarney, not an appetizing story and no standard romance. The Wakaman produces his art with high concentration while he fantasizes what it would feel like to be a thousand prospective faces. He does not like La Pula. He is deeply, he has a deeply felt affinity with a level of art that is steeped in values. The, ex the exhibition in 2005 received no critical response and was barely mentioned in art papers except for a radio interview here or there, but it wasn't mentioned. So it's so funny because I'm looking, Remy is sitting here and I'm talking about him like he's not here. It's just the weirdest thing ever. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so the Wakaman grabbed the opportunity when this defining moment uh, came with this wealth and this well-funded opportunity occurred. This moment happened with the Mondrian Fund, which in initiated the uh, Intendant Culturele Diversiteit, which I translated as Cultural Diversity Administrator. What am I to say, yeah? It was a development prize for cultural diversity that recognized the, Waka, the first Wakamang efforts um, as a project by Dutch Afro artists. And in this moment of diversity thinking, they were not approached, and this is important, because in this moment of diversity thinking, they were not approached as Dutch artists per se, but arguably they were targeted as Surinamese artists living in the Netherlands. Okay, this difference is very, this is important. And now with the upcoming exhibition, 13 years later, Critic Rutger Ponce is reiterating the critique that was heard during the Intendant Culturele Diversiteit, stating that it seems a bit artificial, particularly because never before had there been so much attention for artists with a non-Dutch background. So he said it now, and this was exactly what was being said 13 years earlier when the Wakaman were doing their project. All right, come again. Is Rutger Pons here? I don't know what you look like, Rutger. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, good. In his words, Rutger Pons' words, and just like at the beginning of this century, it strongly seems like neglection, in the words still, it strongly needs, like this neglection needs to be corrected in one go. So back then, the artist, the Wakaman artist, responded by stating that the Wakaman project dealt with the problems of categorization, recognition, and interpretation, and uh, that they encounter as non-Western artists living in the West. 
Great, I'm halfway, good. So in the end, the Wakaman group fell apart, the three artists, uh, and that was based on ideological uh, differences in how to approach the diversity question in the Dutch art of that period. It resulted in two distinct ways of curating. Michael Tejas' argument was to eat the frame, which according to curator and critic Rob Pere, is referring to the Dutch art funds that have to invest in political correct projects or lose their state funding and consequently are forced to make the difference between white and black artists. And as such, they stigmatize the black artists who comply by performing black artists, blackness in the compiled frame. This is the Teja argument, right? Like, eat the frame. Interestingly, Remy Jungemann and Gillian Gransla's route was exactly that, to lo locate the art production in a broader diaspora discourse. So they didn't locate the art production in the Netherlands, they located it in a broader diaspora discourse. And um, that's not here in the text, but as such, by locating it somewhere else, the validation of the work wasn't coming from within the Netherlands where, you know, they were being treated as non-Dutch. Yeah? So, um, through the curatorial, this, through this curatorial decision and with the book Wakamang Drawing Lines Connecting Dots, there you go. Blackness is performed in such a way that it dives deep into the frame and suggest options from within the existing structure. In the action plan, Jungemann and Gransan stated, as artists, we can and want to exert influence on some relevant and returning elements, categorization, recognition, acknowledgement, frame of res reference, and interpretation in art and a discussion on art. So even though both curatorial paths, eating it and diving into it, were grappling with issues surrounding established artistic discourse in this environment of Dutch diversity thinking in the arts, it is, it is the embracing of their Afroness by the Jungerman group that was situated in a broader discourse that uh, is of interest here for this topic. The Wakaman group in which Remy was a curator included Iris Kentmill, Patricia Kaiserhout and myself as Dutch artists. As mentioned, the, the chosen strategy for inclusion in the Dutch art discourse towards full recognition and as part of the Dutch artistic landscape. Am I still with Are you still with me, Jawa? Okay. Paradox it paradoxically meant that culturally we had to pass for Surinamese. So we were cultural Dutch, but we had to pass for cultural, culturally as Surinamese to get this whole thing going. So at that period in time, it seemed that public cultural identification with our parents' homeland rather than with the Netherlands was the frame in which our work could be understood. In other words, it was a kind of a world art approach to locating Dutch Afro-artistic output. In this process, the Junge Man Wakama artist thus translated what was known to them personally as one hybrid subjectivity to the art world as two distinct cultural identities and translate that again into a visual language which was critical but recognizable as a non-native subjectivity within the Dutch context. So it was an approach that underscored the Dutch attitude to an engagement with its colonial past while firmly claiming Dutch culturality. And it was firmly claiming Dutch culturality through colonialism. So as a, as a methodology. So from, this point, from the point of view of, this, of the dominant discourse, this approach followed the historically established narrative of explicit different, difference when it comes to the valuation of art production. What is missed here, and from the point of view of the artist, is the subversive quality of this approach, which intended to negate this quality argument. A review of the book Drawing Lines Connecting Dots read, I want to repeat that, just so you get what I said, so you don't mistake. What is missed, what was missed through the curatorial practice of Remy Jungemann uh, with his Wakaman group, is that from the point of view of us as artists, it was, there was a subversive quality to it. And this subversion was by diving into the frame. And with this approach, we try to negate the quality argument, the so-called difference between our race slash ethnicity 
and the quality of the work. So a review of the book Wakamang Drawing Lines Connecting Dots read, the strength of this book is that the artists speak for themselves and are not afraid of self-criticism. They have cast off the role of the victim and show that there is not a simple univocal solution. And then, and now, again in the upcoming exhibition, um, this strategy seems central. Right. The question arises, whether this distinct Wakaman presence then in an artistic position that can pass as culturally native in the Dutch environment. Um, sorry, I have to re-put this question. The question arises whether this distinct Wakaman present resulted in an artistic position that can pass as culturally native in the Dutch environment, a Dutch environment that is preoccupied with native and immigrant position in relation to its idea of national self, what it is. An environment where the artist in entangle, is entangled in the paradox of inhabiting and denying the space that is set out for them on the basis of ethnicity. Yesterday I met Wakaman and asked why they had come, what they wanted to see. From their clothes and the way they talked, I deduced that some were not from around here, yet were not strangers, or maybe they were since they were not here to look at anything. They were here to be looked at, not to buy, to sell. Oh, great, observed little, little Red Riding Hood, smiled and encouraged me to say more. So I asked them, where is your stall? Apparently they didn't have a permanent stall, but rented half a stall every now and then at world festivals or events for non-natives, children, the disabled, women, the homeless, and drug addicts. There's not much profit in it, said Wakaman. But even the jester has its place in this story. I really am impressed because carrying on walking around in this fairy tale and being fingered by the sleazy cliches of the market so defensively demonstrated such a natural resistance. Just you wait, says Little Red Riding Hood. More money, more money. Dumas is not from these parts, but belongs now, just like you. And she's doing just fine. Yes, and that's exactly what Wakaman wants too, I answer, a little too enthusiastically. Shocked by my own re reaction, I take her hand and smile at her, caressing her with my voice. Because of the way they perceive this fairy tale, Wakaman's trade has almost no quantifiable effect on the public domain or the market as they wander around. Their thoughts drift like stray vendors who only occupy space and set up their stalls after closing time and hastily de dismantle them when the mainstream customers flood back again in the morning. Wakamang is not a counter movement, but a movement, a visual sinuosity between the lines of the market and the interpretation of the storyline of our fairy tale. Little Red Riding Hood, I say, as I help her sit, you know, Little Red Riding Hood, Wakamang is romantic. Not like, in being in, not like in being in love, but like the Romans do. Do as the Romans, speaking your own local language as if it's a natural part of the language of this public domain. From vultures on the periphery uh, with rational global people, sorry, with vultures from my eyes, God. <laughs> from vultures on the periphery of attention, they have become the predators of their own language. Wakaman deals not with rational global people, but with romantic local people. Therefore, Wakama explains nothing. In this wak market, Wakama tells stories in its own language about the stratification of people as a collage of words. Wakama is like the fairy tale of the invention of the can before there was a can opener. Or of the compass, compass before anyone knew the magnetic pole was by Greenland or the use of nuclear power before we know what to do with the waste. Little Red Riding Hood, Little Red Riding Hood, are you asleep? So as we are, I have five minutes left, but I could go on or shall I call it quits here? Yeah? Okay, let me have a bit of water then. <clears throat> So we've set the stage. Um, 
concerning the political and policy background, what was going on. Wakaman came in, they did their, their thing. The story Little Red Riding Hood kind of explains how they felt and how they were critiquing the system. <clears throat> so um, the way in which one, when one can pass into the existing uh, cultural narrative or place one is signed to kind of depends on the way in which the self-effort, in which, sorry, it depends on the way in which the self-evidence of one's blackness is negotiated in today's Dutch artistic environment. The mytho-poet Edgar Cairo, who differently than Frans Fanon, was not so concerned with the psychological effects of whiteness on the black body, but more on how to remain black within white society, felt obliged to defend afro surinamese storytelling by saying, why couldn't a Bush Negro make a clear narrative in his tradition? Not extensive in terms of Dante and Petrarch, but as deep. Cairo, who is a contemporary of Stanley Brown, succeeded and stretched, stretched his linguistic virtuosity so far as to arrive to a new original literary language, a new black Dutch. Through intellectual labor and reinvention of self, both artists, in their own way, succeeded in acquiring a place in Dutch cultural life. One, by embracing this blackness and deliberately exaggerating its otherness through language, that was uh, uh, Edgar Cairo, and we can see that exaggeration now in words like uh, you know, it's in the newspaper, they say fitty, they, they use all these Surinamese words that Edgar Caro was using in the, in the 70s and 80s. And the other uh, found their place in Dutch cultural life by erasing the self and with it any trace of blackness, resulting in the absence of black with, blackness as a way to culturally pass and circumvent the label of otherness. So it is important to note that when Stanley Brown was selected to represent the Netherlands at the Biennial with a solo exhibition in 1982, he was not referred to as a Surinamese artist at all. So when controversy arose this time around, around uh, Stanley Brown's participation in the exhibition, the artist um, and the proposition that looked at the idea of national identity became Surinamese in some new out, news outings. So an artist that was never considered Surinamese was all of a sudden considered Surinamese because of the brouhaha that was going on. So, okay, yeah, well, how else can I say it? <laughs> According to Het Parole, Brown's work was questioned in this context because he never, and the, uh, uh, this is the, okay, I'll talk you through it because this is the machination of this quality argument thing, how it is how it invents itself, reinvents itself, and tries to hide itself in whiteness, which I call neutrality, for the sake of uh, not getting into a fight with anyone. <laughs> so, when controversy arose with regards to Stanley Brown's participation in the exhibition, the artist and the proposition that looked at the idea of national identity became Surinamese in some news out things. So, uh, Parole questioned um, in this context because he never, ex because Brown never expressed about his own identity or about the importance or value. The word that was used in Dutch is belong, which is, you can't, it's not a straight translation. So, interest, thank you. When English is not your native language, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so never expresses her uh, own identity about the interest of a national identity. The Volkskrant noted that Brown's representative expressed that the widow's objections had to do with the fact that it was a group exhibition and that Brown hardly ever participated in those as the perception of his work changes in that context, which is also like, well, you know, do your history, we know better. So the critique that came was that the Dutch biennial jury was sleeping with this selection and shot straight into the fashionable rows of identity politics, or so the curator and jury must have thought, according to the Volkskrant. The curator denies selection based on Surinamese background and insists that they are three Amsterdamers 
who show society that it should not stare blind, not stare blind to the past, but also do not throw itself into a new of utopia. So confirming grounding in what is known as culturally recognizable, I use the word kultur eigen, which is not a word in English, but I think it's a better word in the sense than native, because there's no translation for kultur eigen, but I'll say this sentence again. So confirming grounding in what is known as culturally recognizable seems a requisite to diffuse critique based on the quality argument. In Brown's time, when it was not useful to be black, if you were looking for an artistic stage in the Netherlands, it resulted, in, it resulted in making his blackness invisible. Stanley Brown, thus, is the early example of an artist dealing with this problem by fully being absor absorbed in the dominant discourse of his time and defying the idea of ethnicity at the same time. Readings of the work until now argue that it is not ethnically driven and as such can be categorized as coming from a neutral concern of the relation between body and environment. This line of argumentation firmly fixes critique on his work within a certain art historical discourse away from ethnicity. So if I had more time, then I would explain to you how then the framing of uh, Jungemann and Iris works within this quality argument and how everybody's trying to not say it but they're saying it at the same time, and how that actually puts an extreme burden on these artists that I feel that they do not deserve. Because both of these artists individually could have filled the pavilion. Together, I know that it is, you know, we're getting, we're getting two for the price of one, and we should be so lucky. <laughs> you know, so thank you, thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Joe Landrecht. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think the word belong here actually maybe refers more to importance rather than interest. Yeah, it's but like, it's, you know. It's always contextual. Anyway, so maybe one or two quick questions and then we'll, we'll have a larger gathering at the end. Um, but I see someone coming to you. Oh, thank you so much, Raoul. Question concerning the Surinamese identity. And try to keep it short. Okay. <laughs> What's the Surinamese uh, identity? Because I thought it's also more or less a colonial Dutch construction. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the corridors or the, the borders of the country, the people that have been brought there, the people that lived there, mm -hmm. the people that were like, uh, you know, the contract laborers brought there. What is the Surinamese? Uh, identity. Is as it not also, a, as I said, a Dutch construct? Well, you already asked the question and answered it, so thank you. Uh, answer uh, the question in themselves. And yeah. it's also like the presentation in the biennial, it's like a question that is answered by itself. You know, it's like a question, you know, and it's I think limited. he answered it. Mm. I think it's answered. Shall, shall we leave it at that? Okay, yeah, but it's clear. <laughs> okay, so we've uh, established that. Let's see if there is another question or something you want to quickly share in relation to this layer there's talk. And thank you so much. No, there's only yeah. one more thing I wanted yeah, to say. And it, I wanted yeah, to add that to your, um, to your talk earlier on, because we are looking for words to speak. Um, how many English speakers are here? OK. Native speakers, huh? so that's. Yeah. So, so how many, everybody speaks <laughs> Dutch? Good. No. And no. Okay. Oh. <laughs> OK, so here's, so. This puts, us, this puts us in a bit of a pickle, I'd say, because as Nancy Awa said earlier, we have to find words to speak um, our own. And as the word native in, in this particular context is not, native is not the same as kultuur eigen, right? 
it so we need to find a kind of words that has a certain um, word value, an emotional and intellectual word value, so we can speak about this uh, quality argument without dropping the R word, because dropping the R word in the Dutch context is like dropping the N word in the American context, right? You c it's so. We need Zullen we to gewoon even drie keer zeggen? Racisme, racisme. Oh nee. nee. <laughs> no. So, and, no, but therefore we need to kind of like. Um, we zouden meer Nederlands moeten spreken. wanneer we dit soort dingen bespreken onder elkaar. Uh, juist ook om die woorden te vinden die we nodig hebben om onszelf te spreken. Dat wilde ik nog even gezegd hebben. It's a fair point because I think that's what a lot of um, journalists also use because we use these, these terms like white appropriation, yeah, it doesn't helper mean whitey, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. And then it's it's like we're um, importing American problems to uh, um, a place yeah. which is which is free of problems, yeah. which it's well, not. Yeah. But so the Dutch so the Dutch the, the, idiom yeah. for it. Right. Yeah. So the, yeah. the argument now is being made that we are using American, you know, they're kind of using our own text against us because we right, said right. it out loud. And now remember the, the concept you know. of race was <laughs> gone to yes, uh, Mitchell's pointing like shut up with next speaker. Uh, no, okay, Thank yes. Um, <laughs> so I want to say <laughs> that that as we as we I ga dat toch yeah, in Nederlands zeggen in dat Nederland we dan uh, gewoon is in Nederlands moeten proberen om. Uh, uh, het over uh, racisme te hebben in onze eigen gelederen, zodat we onze eigen woorden kunnen vinden om dat op een voor ons acceptabele manier te bespreken. Dank u, Charles Landvreugd.